Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady, and I'm here with my co-host, Matt Scott. And we're going to talk today about... The coolest car yeah. ever made and the only one to ever be displayed in the Louvre. That's right. So I think. We, yeah, I believe so. And yeah. we, are, we are coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Range Rover. And this is a vehicle that I've, that I've owned several of the models and enjoyed personally and traveled... Yeah traveled on various continents with and and certainly have a lot of wonderful memories associated with and that goes well beyond my memories associated with Land Rover in general but we're very fortunate today to have Simon Turner with us Simon Turner is the the Land Rover product manager for the entire Land Rover family and he has been extremely gracious with his time today with Matt and I talking about the the Range Rover and uh, thank you so much, Simon, for being on the call. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to do it. Well, one, one of the first things that comes to mind for me is just how clandestine and cool the launch of the original Range Rover was. I mean, it was, it was nearly in the spirit of James Bond with this disguised model as the Velar. Can, can you share a little bit about what was the excitement internally and what was some of some, what were some of the emotions that were happening yeah. within Land Rover I mean, when did, this new model came did out? Did you know that you had something that would kind of change the automotive landscape? I mean, think of the luxury SUV, you know, space right now. I mean, it's, it's huge. There's so many. I mean, it really started this vehicle and an entire genre of the automotive industry. Yes, and, and in some ways, we like to think of it... Um, commencing the um, era of the SUV in, in the sense we know it today. So um, way back in the 40s where, when the original Land Rover products were uh, conceived, uh, I don't think we had any idea uh, what it might lead to. But um, during that period from the 40s to 1970 when the Range Rover was uh, really born, uh, that was a, a period after the Second World War where there was just a lot of excitement and growth in many areas of the uh, auto industry. And I think um, prior to 1970, when the product um, did come to life, there was a couple of times when um, some of the um, management team and senior executives actually did realize that there probably was a really good opportunity there for something that was more luxurious, had... Uh, certainly a similar level of capability, but just was presented in a, in a more upmarket way. And although those ideas didn't come to light uh, initially when they were conceived, uh, six, ten years later, eight to ten years later, early 70s was when we saw this uh, tremendously exciting time when um, the Range Rover was born. And um, it really did uh, come around in the marketplace that really what was seen to be the start of that SUV era. Uh, so in many ways, we think of it, uh, you know, from that perspective, we were one of the early pioneers um, in that segment, in the SUV segment, and really set the scene for what, uh, what the segment and the SUV market would become. So uh, influential, really exciting time, and um, hats off to the guys who originated the idea because uh, they were they were I think well ahead of their time. Yeah, and it, I think one of the coolest things is that fifty years later, you know, as as we kind of spoke, we're coming on that that big anniversary. You're still kind of defining the segment, and I think that that's that's really I don't know. I, I find that fascinating. Fifty years of endurance of a product still being class leading and still being defining. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting vehicle. It really is. And, and it leads to, in my mind, when, when the Range Rover first came out, it was a solution to the country wagon. It was a high clearance vehicle that you could drive to church, you could drive it to the store, you could drive it to a business meeting, you could pull the horse trailer with it, and then you could also get out into the field if you needed to. And I think it's, in my mind, having owned many Range Rovers, it's that breadth of capability that was always most endearing to me. Do you, do you feel like that that, is, that was the original intent? Was that breadth of capability? And do you feel like that is still an emphasis in new product design for Range Rover today? 
Uh, yes, it, it's absolutely key for us, and uh, it underpins everything we do as a as a business, uh, not just on Range Rover, but on the span of Land Rover products as well. Um, every Land Rover is designed and developed with capability at its hand, and uh, it is just one of the things that we will not sacrifice. Um, we we put lots of time and energy into making sure that our um, products compete effectively in the marketplace. And one of the things that really appeals, particularly uh, with Range Rover to the customers and the clientele we sell to, is that um, mindset of confidence and inspiring confidence for them to attack their lives uh, in whatever way they deem appropriate for them. Yeah, so uh, without the capability Without that breadth of capability, uh, we just not would would not have the recipe that we've got and uh, the resonance we have with the clientele and customers we, we we've built uh, relationships with. You know, one of the things I always think of with the Range Rover is that it's it's such a stable platform. It's it's it excels in almost everything that it does. I've I've had these vehicles on everything from twisty roads where it's a pleasurable vehicle to drive. It's a nice experience. It's quiet. It's comfortable. And I've had these things driving up the waterfall and, you know, poison spider and Moab and, and everything that they do within their limit is just, it's kind of effortless. And I think that that's a really, really cool um, aspect of that vehicle. Cause there are, you know, competitive vehicles, but I, I feel like there's nobody that has that massive breadth of capability. I mean, they can be more comfortable than a traditional touring sedan and then they can be as capable as you know a... i think that's absolutely right and uh we focus on that front and foremost there are many many great suvs out there in the marketplace but we view what we do with range rover as having just an exceptional level of capability and that breadth of capability that you mentioned but couple that with an exquisite interior and the luxury appointment and the refinement that we engineer into the products as well. That's just, we believe, a winning recipe uh, and part of the reason, or significant part of the reason Range Rover has been uh, so successful over the years. And with, with it all starting with the name Velar, which ultimately came back into the lineup uh, many decades later, when I was doing some research on the history, Velar just means to veil or to hide in Italian, I believe. And is are there any fun stories that you've got from the archives or from your the folks that you've met through the years in your 17 years with Land Rover, where they talk a little bit about that history with the Velar? Well, I think it's pretty much exactly as you, you laid it out. And it was uh, a little bit of a play uh, obviously, uh, uh, clever, a clever play when we actually did launch a product that was named Valal in the later years. But certainly, uh, the early prototypes of Range Rover did, you know, drive around with the name Valar on them. So um, I can well imagine. Oh, I wasn't around at the time and involved, but I can well imagine that. Uh, uh, there were several uh, people uh, seeing it within the business had some fun with that um, <laughs> and, and keeping it behind closed doors as it were and trying to make it fit in. Uh, imagining that you can make a Range Rover fit in during that time frame is, is kind of amusing as well, but that's nevertheless the, the story. So I don't have anything really more unique than that to share with you, but I, I think the selection of the name and the use of it back in that time was uh, clever and, um, you know, kind of underpins um, some of the um, uh, advertising uh, that we adopt with Range Rover, which is uh, uniquely quite clever sometimes in the For way sure. you promote the I love some of, those, some of those Range Rover uh, ads. There's that, like that. there's that iconic one with the white Range Rover with the mud on the, the, mud on the side that I want to see you guys redid a few years ago. Um, you know, so, so here's a question for you. Maybe this is a little bit more more oddball, but we're all Land Rover enthusiasts here. If you could pick one Range Rover throughout the entire history of, 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 the, of the model, what would it be for you? Uh, <laughs> I'd have to flip a coin. It would even be, either be the first one or the last one. <laughs> uh, either the classic or the current car. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's so many ways you could 
you could make that decision, but I, I, I'm right on the fence. I think yeah, one of the cool ahead. things is that you can actually go buy one of the first Range Rovers yeah. as new through your the Classic Vehicles program, or you can go buy the old one. Sorry, I mixed that one up there, but yeah, the Classic Vehicle program that you guys do is also really fascinating. I remember being over there. Yeah, um, beautiful cars. Yeah, I remember actually seeing the first Velar in that facility. Yeah. Not the first, but but one of them. Uh, you were talking about the classic um, SV facility in the UK, I, I think, there. Yes. Um, which, you know, um, I was referring to the classic um, as the first Range Rover, and, and, and yes, there's several ways to use classic within the context of Range Rover. When we transitioned from um, the class, what we know to be the classic Range Rover now, so the first generation, to the, the P38A, um, there was a period of time uh, about, a, I think it was a model year, if I'm remembering correctly, where both of those, the first generation and the second generation, existed or coexisted in the marketplace at, at the same time. So clearly, uh, we needed a way to uh, differentiate the old from the new or sure. the previous from the new. And the original model then became known as the classic. And that just happens to resonate well with. Uh, the conversation started there on SV, which is a leg of the organization called Classic that actually um, has built its business around restoring many of the old products that maybe customers come across, uh, enthusiasts come across in their life and they're interested in having it restored on a you know professional manufacturer-led basis. So that business is known as SV Classic and, and it's... Um, it's a really interesting place to go, as you pointed out, and full of uh, interesting um, older products, which just for me capture my imagination whenever I go there. They're fantastic. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I remember walking through those halls and seeing Range Rover Classics, Series Land Rovers, beautiful, stunning Jaguars. I just, I just remember wanting to buy every everything. single one. Absolutely. Every single one of them. Absolutely. Everything. Every single one of them. Yeah. yeah, you're right. The, from 1994 to 1996, the P38 was, uh, was available at the same time as, as the Range Rover Classic. And, and it, it's certainly interesting to see that transition. It shows the pa the passion that the consumers had for the original model, and then the excitement that they had for the for the new one that was coming on the market. One of the things that we see uh, around those transition points is there's generally a uh, an uplift in the interest in the outgoing model. Uh, I mean, I guess you see that on occasions in the industry with other products, but we we see that uh, with Range Rover very clearly that. Uh, you know, during the, the last year or so, um, before a new product is phased in, there's usually strong interest in the last one because of the, I guess, the allegiance and the fact that um, many people get to like that particular style over the over the life cycle of it, and sometimes it's not clear and apparent to a lot of those customers that they'll actually grow to like the new one. So. The interest in the older one or the outgoing one is often heightened. Sure. Um, so it's a little interesting phenomena. No, that certainly makes sense. I, I think about uh, one of the Range Rovers that that personally I appreciated the most. I I, I owned a, a Mark III Range Rover, the L322, for many years, and it it was literally one of the finest automobiles that I've ever owned, and it was the first. Land Rover that began to give me genuine confidence behind the reliability of the brand and, and that the reliability had shifted so much since since the 2001 Discovery that I owned and since the Range Rover Classic that I owned and 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 some of the other models that uh, maybe I struggled with a little bit more but you could really see the evolution of the platform with the Mark III Range Rover you can really see where the L322 was this culmination of all of that legacy with now the combination of of the next level of engineering and reliability. Yeah. How do you see the the L322? Do you see that in the same way internally, that it was really this transition and this highly defining transition for the model? 
Oh, absolutely, and I think you nailed it. Um, that was probably the most significant step forward uh, we took with Range Rover at the time when we when we conceived and developed the uh, L322. Um, just the levels of not just capability, but the the recognition that if we were to be successful in the Range Rover market, what we really needed to do was master the fundamentals, make the uh, vehicle perform as a luxury vehicle, because that's where we positioned it, and also drive the levels of refinement uh, and composure that come with uh, a luxury vehicle, drive those in forward significantly without losing that winning recipe, which was always about the design, but also as the important, the capability side of, of what 322 was. It was a tre- tremendously capable vehicle, but the things that moved the most for that product were the levels of luxury and refinement and, you know, just the general build quality of that product. Very, very solid and very well built. Yeah, I mean, to go from the, the P38, which maybe for our listeners that aren't super huge into Land Rovers, that ran from, I want to say, 94 to 2000. 2002 in the yeah. U.S. Um, to go from That's that right. vehicle to go to the the L322, which was 2002, 2003 to 2012, I mean, it was it was the same vehicle. You knew that it was a Range Rover. You knew when you drove it what you were driving, but it was drastically different. Yeah. Um, yeah, there were some significant changes. It went from solid axle to independent, which, of course, people were suspicious of in the beginning, but the independent suspension had so much articulation yeah. and wheel travel. I believe it was well over 12 inches. It, of it's art- always been the future, and and you see that on the new Defender as well, just how far evolved that really has become, and I guess it, I guess that technology all really started with, with the Range Rover. I mean, you always see that, I guess, in the Land Rover product line is, Range Rover is up top and then it kind of all trickles down to there. And, and that's quite yeah. cool. I, I, I love, I love, you know, I always call it the Mark three yep. Range Rover. You know, we just asked Simon what his favorite, his favorite Range Rover was. That's actually my favorite. An L322 or Mark three yeah. in Tangiers orange. They did that. I, I want to say in the United States, we got eight of the G4 edition Range Rovers, and that's always been on my bucket list to own one of those. They're such fascinating vehicles. I mean, that was the first car that we really saw that had, you know, train response and had that rear locking differential rear locking as well. Diffs yeah. And the little levers for the adjustable suspension. It was just, I mean, it was, it was like being on a different planet. It was so far advanced, and it now was. you're just seeing manufacturers, other manufacturers, really start to catch up, and it's cool because that car came out. 2002 <laughs> 2002 so yeah. it was designed over 20 years ago now, yeah i guess yeah, it's unbelievable it's unbelievable and and for those that are listening just to to go, do a quick punch list of some of the significant historical elements of the range rover it, you know in 1972 john blashford snell led a, a team of adventurers on their trans america's expedition and they drove from um, up in the northern part of North America, all the way through the Darien Gap into South America. And they took Range Rovers through there and and at, and at great personal cost and effort uh, to achieve that. That was one of the first trips through the Darien Gap and a very notable one. And, and in 1979, the Range Rover competed in the Paris-Dakar race, even in the, in the early 2011-2012 timeframe. Uh, Land Rover did a Silk Road expedition with their new hybrid model Range Rover. The Camel Trophy featured the Range Rover as well in the late 80s. So the Range Rover was not just a luxury vehicle. Land Rover at the time very much positioned it as an adventurer's vehicle. And Simon, are you? I know that you have such passion for the brand, but are you seeing that the goals for, for Range Rover today is also representing that goal towards the adventurer, the affluent adventurer, the well-traveled individual. Yes, I, I think so. Um, certainly, we have products in the in the portfolio that appeal more directly to the adventurer. But adventure is, to some degree, relative to us all. Right, where we sit in our lives, what we like to do, 
what our interests are and what our pastimes are. So I think the way we like to look at it is we we provide a vehicle that will enable adventure, whatever that might mean to you. And I I think that Range Rover clearly um, has got the heritage, it's got the capability, it's got the historical elements to its past that certainly build that. Um, you know, is it the is it the best off road vehicle in the world? Probably not, but it delivers as a balance and the breadth of capability and the type of environment to drive in that we have found our customers love, uh, the folks who actually buy Range Rovers. So um, I think it comes down again to what adventure means to you and um, confidence while you're driving is key. And the Range Rover, just like it always has, inspires confidence to those who drive it. So whether you're bouncing over a curb or you're doing some really extreme stuff in Moab, um, you know, both of those things could be viewed as <laughs> adventuresome, I guess. Yeah, n- yeah, no question. No question. I think one of my favorite things that, you know, you just touched on is the confidence. And I think a lot of that comes from the driving position that a Range Rover has has always maintained that, and I guess I'll call it the command position, I want to say was Land Rover's term for it a while ago. You know, you kind of, I don't want to say you sit on top of a Range Rover, you have very good visibility always in a Range Rover. I find whether you are, like you said, in Moab or you're in Los Angeles or New York, like they're very easy vehicles to drive. Yeah, despite their size. They always yeah. had the the very, nar- <clears throat> very narrow A pillars and the very narrow B pillars that gave yeah. this very open glass feel. And that clamshell hood just allows you to see exactly where the front end is. On so many modern vehicles, you know, they had this kind of sloping hood that's really aerodynamic and works its way down. And you just don't really know where the car is. And, and I think just the position and the form factor of the Range Rover is... I mean, I've always said it's it's the best sized car. Like you sit in a new Range Rover, and you're like, oh, this is this is kind of perfect. Like a Tahoe is way too big, especially for North America. I mean, it, there's definitely times in London I think that a Range Rover might feel a little large, but but it's amazing for certainly for the North American consumer. It is a it is a right sized SUV, and I also I like the fact that Land Rover has never overdone the window tint. They've never made it. A, a seven passenger. They've always kept it very pure to the original design. And as this leads to another question, Simon, it appears to me, and this is just an, an assumption that I have, that the goal was always to maintain that purity of the big body Range Rover and then fill out the Range Rover models with the other interests of your clients. So for example, the sport appeals to someone who wants something that's more athletic, or the maybe the the evoke is something that's more affordable. Is that the goal right now? Is to make sure that you're able to offer a Range Rover to a wider range of customers? Yeah, so I I think that's probably well, that's fair and and and, and correct. I I view that from the standpoint of just a, a business and a maturing business. As you become more successful, you have the ability to reach out to different parts of the market that you maybe weren't operating in. And it's always been, you know, our ambition to, to grow the Range Rover market and to deliver products into different segments of the, of the marketplace that are relevant to those segments. Um, so, you know, over the last eight, ten years, we've been very active with the Range Rover family in doing just that. Um, you know, at the time we had, the P38 or the L322, there was basically just a single Range Rover in the family. And it wasn't until uh, 2011 when the Vogue arrived, uh, which was completely unexpected to many people. They did not conceive of uh, a Range Rover product, you know, on that sort of scale, smaller scale, uh, resonating or being successful. But uh, it was absolutely the right recipe for you know, developing into other areas of the marketplace, uh, and certainly in Europe, some of the cities in Europe, uh, etc., where space is a premium, it was you know, urban chic. It has carries the Range Rover brand badge, and it's uh, very, very appealing to um, customers in those markets for different reasons. To the big one being appealing, you know, maybe to us here in America, where we've got more wide open spaces. So. Um, 
the the movement in and development in the Range Rover brand has been very uh, considered. I think it's fair to say, and where we've grown, the directions we've taken have been following, you know, market research, understanding where we believe there's an opportunity to expand the range, and then working rigorously to uh, deliver, offer, design, build, and deliver something that meets the Range Rover requirements in terms of capability and breadth of capability, but do it in a very unique design and capability-led way. Um, And following on from um, Evoque, we had obviously the Velar um, arriving in 2018. I skipped over Sport because Sport actually, I guess, Generation 1 Sport dates back to 94, 95. Um, I think is, uh, sorry, 2004, 2005, got my decades mixed up there. <laughs> um, but uh, sport really uh, came about at a time when there were certainly people uh, within the organization who did not think there was a place for two full-size Range Rovers in, in the portfolio. They thought one would be more successful than the other, and there just weren't the buyers around for a second Range Rover. And wow, um I guess we've disproved that one pretty clearly right now with, you know, the CTS for both of those products, uh, for Range Rover Sport being in the 25,000 range in terms of volume for North America and Range Rover's been touching 20,000. So is Range Rover Sport the best yeah. selling vehicle that Land Rover North America offers? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. It sells, um, the highest volume of anything we have in the portfolio. We spent some time with the Range Rover Sport uh, at Eastner uh, when we when we were there under our own Velar of disguise <laughs> during the during the Defender reveal that Matt and I were fortunate to be able to go to. But I was I was so impressed with how capable the Range Rover Sport was, and for those that are listening, obviously this audience is very much focused on overland travel and global travel, but we also recognize that many of our listeners also own daily drivers and they own vehicles like Range Rovers in addition to the Defender that they may own or or, or a, a Land Cruiser that they may own. They, they oftentimes buy vehicles like Range Rovers. And uh, when, when we're talking to our audience, we often remind them that it is models like the Velar and it's models like the Evoque the success of those models, the success of the Range Rover Sport is what allows for a company like Land Rover to invest with some confidence in a product like the Defender. So it's very easy to say, oh, I don't like that vehicle. Well, it's maybe not the right vehicle for you, but because Land Rover does so well with these other models, it allows them to take some risk with something that has over 11 inches of ground clearance and excellent you know, locking differentials and and almost 33 inch tall tires with the Defender. So as an, a passionate enthusiast of the Land Rover brand, I want to thank you, uh, Simon, obviously for the, the fact that you guys have chosen to take some risk with Defender. Um, now, would you kind of reflect that, that it's the overall success of the brand that's allowed you guys to take some risks with some more capable models? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, Defender Defender in some ways, I use that word risk, um, Defender in some ways was, the engineers and the designers would shoot me for saying this, but probably the easiest uh, to visualize in terms of what you need it to be because of what the old one was and what it did. Um, Because there's no, there's just no way we could have got away with doing anything less than what we've done with Defender um, because of, again, what came before it. The Defender model, um, it's where it all started for Land Rover. It had that unique design and it also had the capability designed in right from the get-go and it was more capable than anything, almost anything around at the time in terms of a, you know, a, a, an auto, uh, a car or, uh, you know, we didn't have SUVs back then, but in terms of the auto marketplace. So 
Um, I think the interesting thing with the latest defender is that the emphasis uh, has really been put into making it rugged, durable, and um, let's say able to absorb uh, abuse or daily usage cycle that be, might maybe uh, outside of what the way we would treat our cows on a day-to-day basis. So it is designed to be what we need it to be on a daily basis, but also to be able to deliver, you know, uh, in situations that might be life and death, that might be extreme, that might be in different remote parts of the world when you actually need to get back or you need to be able to do the job you went there for. Um, so I think that's the tough bit for Defender, actually being able to deliver that in in a, an authentic way um, that's relevant to today, today's time with you know the levels and standards of capability that has evolved you know over the the past 20 30 40 50 years and 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 be able to do that in a in a relevant way today that that gives the product appeal for you and me who might not well maybe we do i don't certainly don't do it every weekend but for you and me who are using the vehicle maybe for a daily driver but more so for those who are going to rely on it to get a job done in you know the most difficult of situations or terrains or environments in the world I think that's the biggest challenge that um, I hope we've achieved uh, for our Defender. And and with the Defender, um, obviously, you know, changing a lot from the previous generation to the new generation. I mean, will that will that change how the Range Rover evolves as well? Now that there's just more options in the marketplace, I know Jerry McGovern has said that you know the presence of the Defender will kind of cause some changes, you know, to the Discovery product line, but I mean, and, and I understand it's a future product if you, if you can't talk about it, but do you think that will kind of change, the presence of it will change Range Rover and where it's going? I think without without being specific about anything, I think there's always um, learning from a new product that you evolve with a certain mindset that can benefit other products in the range. Um, I, I, I think that's just a healthy part of doing something new, fresh and different and challenging the business challenging itself. So there'll be learning from Defender that will have benefit to both Range Rover and Discovery. But what I would say, just um, to be clear, is that Range Rover occupies a place in the market that is very much towards the luxury end. Well, it is the luxury end. And the delivery or the priorities, the attribute priorities that we have for Range Rover are very clear and set in their own right. They have you know, lots of design um, strength, but also this capability aspect. But they've got to be able to deliver the experience that we want in a, you know, very luxury composed and refined way. Now, those compromises for a discovery product and a defender may be a little different. Um, You know, in terms of, Nobody would really necessarily think of Defender as being luxurious. Uh, it doesn't really need to be. That's its mission in life is to be durable, dual purpose, rugged, and to be able to do all of the things that we need a Defender to do. If we wanted it to be luxurious, then it probably we'd have to make some compromises to it to allow it to, to do that or to deliver on that level. So just going full circle here, Certainly elements of learning from Defender that will benefit the other products in the line. But certainly, you know, are we going to make our Range Rover products like Defenders? Uh, No, I don't think so. I think you'll see a continuation of the very successful theme that Range Rover's carried for for many years, and that will be to keep designing, delivering highly capable, exquisitely designed exteriors and interiors and have the Range Rover deliver the type of uh, luxury and refinement that people buying a, a luxury vehicle expect. And I think what's so fascinating about the new Range Rover, um, it hasn't really changed much. You know, it's it's almost kind of become a bit more iconic than maybe previous models have while it's still a current, <laughs> a current vehicle. And I think that that's quite cool. I think that's kind of a testament to 
to the original design of the vehicle. Um, you really can't tell much of a difference between a 2013 and a new one. I know there's been some grill changes and light changes and obviously upgrades, but yeah, I, I, I think that that's, it, it's really I, fascinating. I think if you, uh, if you trace the lines back of the current product to the original classic, that have got some uh, really good graphics that show this when we were getting ready to launch the current car. You can see the design lines uh, have carried through from the original classic through to the, the current generation. And the reason I emphasize that is, is because it shows that lineage that I think you're referring to, yeah. uh, the connectedness of the models that we've delivered. But it also is very, it's a very uh, considered position that we've taken. We do uh, periods of market research, obviously, through the life cycle of products. And, um, you know, whenever we're conceiving and finalize, or conceive and finalize a design, we, we check back with the marketplace and we check back with the customers uh, that we, we know will be interested in the, in the new car. We hope will be interested in the new car. And we look for feedback and, you know, one of the consistent um, lines of feedback that we receive from, from our customers is, you might have heard this and I apologize if, if you have, but the, the, common, the common phrase is, don't change it, just make it better. So yeah. what that says to us is the underlying themes of Range Rover are solid and resonate perfectly with the clientele that buy them and, and the customers who buy them. But they want to see in the new product, they want to see how their new Range Rover or the new Range Rover connects with the past. And they want to see that lineage and they want to be able to express that, you know, maybe in the, in the world that they live in. They've got the Range Rover. The Range Rover is consistent through its generations. Okay, it's changed. There's technology added, there's capability added, the scale and size may have grown a little bit, but there are consistent elements of the design that have just stayed true and carried through uh, the generations of Range Rover that we have uh, conceived and, and delivered. Yeah, I mean, they're one of the few vehicles out there that you, you can almost point anybody towards any generation, and they just they look like a Range Rover. They're just, yeah, they're distinguishable as that. And, and I think that luxury itself has continued to evolve. Uh, luxury in the 1980s is very different from the luxuries of today. And more and more often we're hearing that, that freedom really is the ultimate luxury. And if, and freedom in my mind is often the ability to have the time to travel and the, to have the right equipment and the right vehicle and the right the right uh, experience to be able to go see the world. And that's why we see travel expanding. I mean, not, not currently in the moment that we're in, uh, we're recording this during the COVID crisis, but uh, we do recognize that overall, that, that freedom, that ability to travel. And I think that when you look at the luxury of Range Rover, I think part of the reason why it has had such staying power and, and models that are similar to that, like the, like the, the G wagon, et cetera, have had such staying power is because they do give the owner that idea that they have the freedom to explore, that they can go up and, and explore the mountains in Colorado or go to that remote fly fishing location or pull their Airstream trailer with it uh, to go camp, whatever that may be. It seems as if that luxury is being redefined as, as automobiles become more commoditized, and as 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 transportation in general becomes more commoditized, I think that the direction that Land Rover has had from the beginning will actually allow you guys to fare well into the future, and and that certainly brings up the question of uh, as you are looking over the whole model line, things like having diesel available, which you did in recent model years, which we Matt and I both thank you very much for that. That car drove beautifully. What are some other things that you guys are thinking about that you can share that lends towards that freedom and that ability to travel as it relates to our audience as travelers? Yeah, so that's a really interesting topic. Um, but some of the 
some of the themes that you see in the marketplace today, I think, will be, um, you know, where the direction future-wise will go. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking sustainability, I'm thinking electrification, I'm thinking enhanced driver assistance. Um, those types of technologies, uh, it's inevitable, I think, will, will come. It's just a question of how quickly and, you know, how, in some ways, how quickly the market can adjust and react. So, you know, that would be, you know, for the next few years, decade, I would see that's where probably the, the industry as a whole and certainly uh, will be looking. Um, you know, if you take the example of some of the cities in Europe that are actually moving now towards banning uh, gasoline and uh, diesel engines in the in the city centres, they're they're just not going to be allowing it for a few years. Well, you know, just imagine the implications of that in terms of automobile choice. Sure, you want to go into a city job. Um, you know, every day you commute every day. Now you're not going to be able to do that in a traditional traditional Range Rover or whatever SUV you might drive. You're going to need to adapt to the times and you'll be looking for vehicles that deliver your ability to live your life how you want to live it. And the vehicles that allow you to do that will be the ones that are on your shopping list. So um, those are the general directions I would see. I think, you know, longer term um, developments in lightweight technology i think there's still a, a a long way to play out in that in that side of vehicle manufacturing and technology stripping weight out of the vehicle um is is key uh but maintaining the strength and rigidity and um you know allowing it to meet all of the requirements that we um need a, a land rover or a range rover product to meet um Still critically important for our buyers. They want that. That's what they buy into that confidence factor. So linking all of those aspects together, material, lightweight technology, electrification, um, and driver assistance features are, I think, where if you look Trump 10, 15 years ahead, I think you'll see, um, you know, products in the marketplace that are, that are becoming um, or have become capable in those fields and um, are delivering things in a different way for consumers as they as they as versus today. I'm so excited for electric. Yeah, you know, a, a few years ago, I I thought electric was the devil. I thought it was I thought it was where automotive enthusiasm enthusiasm was going to go to die. And after driving the E Pace. I, I'm I'm so sold on it, and and to I, I'm I'm daydreaming over here because I'm thinking, okay, Range Rover luxury, the power of electric motors, how you're going to be able to integrate that with autonomous technology, that's going to be so cool. I mean, that I mean that's going to be the ultimate car, I mean the, the ultimate vehicle in a lot of ways to be able to charge it at home, to be able to charge it at your hotel, not have to worry about really getting gas. I think I. I, I'm just so fascinated by, by by the concept of electrification of of these classic platforms, um, and it seems like it lends toward it lends towards exactly what you've spoken about this whole conversation, Simon. Is that breadth of capability? These are new capabilities that your consumers, your customers are expecting, and you're just adding it to the repertoire of what a Range Rover can do. If you if you need to drive into London, no problem. You have a plug-in hybrid that will run on electrification only to get you into the city center. Uh, but then you can still go out into to your farm in in the countryside and tow a horse trailer, or go to a fly fishing location, or go camping with your family. And I I think that the expectation of the consumer continues to expand. So Range Rover it seems uniquely capable of providing that breadth that you speak of. Yeah, I was thinking I was thinking earlier this week how great an electric car would be during this crisis and not having to go to a gas station and touch a dirty gas pump, you could just yeah. charge it at your house. I so fascinated, so excited for for where the technology is going to take us. Yeah, I think the industry as a whole has, you know, some 
some technical challenges to work through in terms of delivering on the the range aspect that people expect and what they what they're comfortable with. I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges for electrification right now. So I you think know, I don't think anybody that. has the answer at this point. Yeah, so it's interesting to, to see where that evolves to and how the scientists can move that forward. Um, there's pent up demand, I'm sure, in the marketplace for electrified vehicles. It's just delivering on the combination of product range and charging infrastructure that everybody will become come to expect. We'll we'll definitely get there. I mean, I I remember paying hundreds of dollars for a 128 megabyte, you know, flash drive, you know, ten years ago and maybe more than ten years ago, but. You know, the, the, the same thing will ha- happens with all technology is the more it gets adopted, the faster it gets adopted, the more prices go down. So, you know, the future will be really interesting for the, for the yeah. Range Rover product line. I think it's exciting. I think that once you plug in the concept of technology into any consumer segment, the evolution happens very, very quickly. If you could see the, I mean, just the implementation rate of an iPhone across the consumer space was overnight. Everybody so, had an iPhone. so rap, so rapid. The same will happen with electric cars. Yeah. We suspect it will happen in that way. And we're encouraged that Land Rover identifies that as an opportunity because you'll bring with it those other attributes that we find important, like being able to get remote and being able to travel to a unique location in Iceland or wherever else you may go in the world. And, um, you know, I think one of the questions that, that I have that I, I shared with you before the conversation um, is I think it would be important for our listeners to hear a little more about what Land Rover has done over the last few decades to continue to improve reliability and durability from within their platforms. I believe that our audience, our readers, our listeners, uh, those that go to our websites, they all have an appreciation and a respect for the Land Rover brand and the Range Rover in particular. But I think this is maybe an opportunity for you to share with them what Land Rover has done to address uh, reliability and improve upon it, um, if you're able to speak to that. Yes, uh, um, absolutely. And I guess I would start by saying that there is no silver bullet um, the progress that's made is made on the basis of hard work, uh, people with the right disposition, and a, a mindset to keep pushing the envelope and improving. Uh, and it's a, a long-term endeavor. It doesn't start and stop. It's something that, as a manufacturer, we are uh, extremely focused on right up to the uh, top level management within the business and and including our you know our CEO in Europe um, it's a prerequisite we believe to success in the marketplace that we're playing and um, we're taking ongoing actions to bolster the resources we put on to uh, improving quality uh, on a on an ongoing basis, so I can just talk a little bit specifically about um, what we do in North America and the approach we have, um, and it it revolves around a, a team of uh, people in the service and engineering side of the business who are resourced to basically do the the day to day diligence of assisting in the resolution of problems on vehicles, but also understanding at a root cause level why things don't operate sometimes how our customers might expect them to. And those individuals have counterparts in all manner and facets of places in the European manufacturing plants and uh, headquarter engineering teams who they're liaising with on a, on a daily, daily basis. Um, you know, whatever the issue might be. So, you know, at a high level, you need to create a culture and an environment where people are allowed to put that quality performance of the product as job one. You know, that needs to be a non-negotiable and you need to have, you need to lead your people to understand them and support that. And then let them get on with the job that they're 
qualified to do, which is, you know, the relentless task of never letting something uh, that isn't unclear slip away, understanding why a problem might have occurred, what failed, why it failed, and, you know, at a detailed level, carrying that back into the engineering teams and plants that we work with in, in Europe. So um, there isn't a simple answer to the question, but what I hopefully have articulated is that, first of all, we take it extremely seriously. Um, we don't believe there is um, any excuse for not delivering high-quality vehicles, and we are committed to doing that. And we use local and uh, international resources, engineers, teams, plants um, to actually work relentlessly at eliminating problems. Um, and, you know, are we, are we where we need to be? No, we never where we need to be. There's always improvements can be made, no matter what it is you're looking at, no matter what problem you're, you're scoping. There's always a way to make it better. And the mindset that we have is to consider that first and foremost and keep pushing the boundaries back in and trying to make the products that we build as, as good as we can make them. Simon, thank you so much for speaking to that. And I can speak from my own personal experience for the audience to hear is um, I've owned Probably, ten, probably <laughs> ten, 10 Land Rovers by now. Uh, currently have a, a, a 1986 Defender 110 with a diesel that it starts every time and it runs great. It does leave its marks here and there. But <clears throat> my earlier Land Rovers required a lot more attention. And and by the time I bought the Mark III Range Rover, I drove that vehicle for nearly 100,000 miles with the, the most minimal of issues. And then I had a 2012 LR4 that I had zero warranty claims on. And then I had a 2015 Range Rover that I had zero warranty claims on. So my own experience and evolution in the reliability of the product line. Um, now, of course, I'm not saying that anyone who buys a new vehicle is going to have zero issues. I'm just simply expressing my experience, which was a very noticeable and continuous improvement in the reliability of the platform, which is, I think, very difficult to do because yeah. the cars are getting more complex than they ever were before. You know, I, I've always thought that Land Rovers were a lot more reliable than people gave them credit for. I, I think that you had, and the enthusiast side, a lot of second, third, fourth owners that were buying vehicles that, you know, maybe weren't properly maintained. And, you know, going, going back in time, going back to the 90s, going back to early 2000s, where, you know, imported cars were, I mean, they were obviously here and they were large, but maybe we were used to more Chevys and more Fords that were just different to work on. And, um, and Land Rover has always been a pioneer of technology. They have always been the one pushing, you know, pushing the evolution of the four wheel drive. So yeah, like the, the you know, the air suspension in the Range Rover classic wasn't that great. Cause it was like the first air suspension the first one, in, yeah. in a car, you know, like, you know, uh, any of the issues, you know, they've, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that I don't give them too much credit, but, I've always thought that they were, you know, they just had a more, uh, a bad rap, let's say. Yeah. And I, I think that it's important to acknowledge it because it's something that people look at as a part of their decision set with looking at a, a Land Rover. And that's why, Simon, I appreciate you speaking to it. And also my own experience with seeing it rep improve so, so greatly. And then to see things like a diesel motor being available for a short period of time in the, in the lineup. Uh, was something that brought a, a big smile to my face. <clears throat> and then, of course, Matt and I being able to spend time in the Defender recently in Namibia, that brought a lot of smiles to my face. So Matt and I both have tremendous love for the brand that you are stewarding, Simon, and, and uh, we're grateful that the newest Defender, it, it isn't a city vehicle. This is a vehicle that is designed to go very challenging and very remote areas in the world. And that is an exciting thing to see. It's exciting to see the whole Land Rover lineup now fill out. I remember a few years ago at the Discovery launch, the, your team talking about these categories of, of luxury and utility and capability and durability, and to now see all of those pillars of your organization 
reflected in products that are available today is is very exciting and, and we're grateful to see that breadth of of, of lineup as well. Yeah, I, I like to say the family's complete now with Defender because <laughs> we've been talking about a fragmented <clears throat> family for a couple of years, right? Well, the family's complete. It's, it's just, gonna, I'm so excited. I mean, for the first time in my adult life, I will actually be able to walk in as an adult and see a Defender on the showroom floor at Land River, and I think that that's a fantastic thing. Yeah, that's very, that's very exciting. I, I, I still remember in the early 90s, going into a Land Rover dealership and seeing a Defender 90 on display in the showroom and being completely w- wide-eyed. I mean, here's this was the camel, tr- this was it yeah. right there and, and available to purchase. So th- these are very exciting times for Land Rover. I know that all of you are very excited for this next chapter. And it, and it kind of leads me to my final question. Uh, and Matt may have something to follow up with, but we want to be sensitive to your time. Um, I know that we've all, we've all been kept inside and we've all not been able to go experience the world in the ways that we want to. If you could, if you could leave tomorrow in any of the new Land Rover products, uh, what vehicle would it be and where would you want to go? If you had an unlimited amount of time and you and your family could go explore somewhere in the world, Simon, where would you want to go? Wow. I think I'd like to go to Namibia where you, you guys were <laughs> in the Defender. Yeah. I'm really that great at sounds like bags. an awesome trip. It was amazing. And was I amazing. saw uh, a lot of the images and videos that came out uh, following that. And I just thought the combination of terrain, environment, animals, the climate were just um, really, really interesting overall. And I'm sure you got to, to experience Defender in its, in its true habitat there or the habitat it excels in. So, that would be what I think would choose. I'd like to choose to do that if, if I had that chance. Uh, well, it, it would be great if your version of social distancing right now was in the middle of the Namib desert. We can all, <laughs> we can all dream of that at the moment. Uh, Matt, do you have any more questions for Simon? You know, I think I'm good. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for your time. You were very gracious with it today. I know you're very busy, and this is a very challenging time for organizations around the world, including automotive and I can see that there is such a bright future for Land Rover because of so much of the emphasis on the heritage and the legacy of the brand. As Overlanders, we are, we are excited about the products that you're bringing to market. And uh, I want to thank you again for being with us today. It was an absolute pleasure uh, to be here with you. And I appreciate all of the, the questions you asked and uh, the opportunity to answer those as, as fully as I could. So, uh, Right. Thank you. You're very welcome, Simon. And we're going to have some additional information in the show notes, including some of the historical references that we made throughout the podcast. And Matt and I want to thank you all for listening today.